Stepping in to Eden, yeah, brother. Stepping in to Eden, yeah, brother. No more trouble in my body or my mind. I live like a king on whatever I find. Eat all the fruit and throw away the rind. Yeah, brother. I cannot believe we are at this point bridge to all decks red alert red alert for a brand new what is sure to be a very lively conversation on enterprise incidents with scott and steve i'm scott nance and i'm steve morris yay brother oh hey i'm gonna flip my fiddle and jump for joy i got a clean bill of health from Dr. McCoy. Yes, folks, we are at that point in Enterprise Incidents. We have reached what could be the most notorious, the most infamous episode of them all. I'm ca- talking about you, brother, on the way to Eden. The reason I say the most notorious, the most infamous, is because, sure, Spock's brain has been ha- has had that label. But Spock's brain is a lot better than I think most people have given it credit for, something we proved in our conversation of Enterprise Incidents. And then there is – and the children shall leave, which is just bad and bad, and that's that's as bad as it's going to get. And then we have another episode coming up, which could have uh, – uh, could also be labeled that way. That's Turnabout Intruder. I'm very curious to see where that conversation goes. But in terms of The Way to Eden, this is an episode that I have, have not watched in – Many, many, many years because in my head, I'm thinking this is a bad episode. This is embarrassing. It's the one with the hippies. This does not represent anything at all about Star Trek. And then I rewatched it to prep for Enterprise Incidents. And boy, I was wrong. Lots to say on this. And joining us, joining us for our deep dive conversation of The Way to Eden, we have a very, very special guest. And I want to thank our good friend who joined us. For the Day of the Dove, that's Laurie Ulster from TrekMovie.com for recommending this guest, someone who I've met many times over the years at the Star Trek conventions in Las Vegas. He's a writer, he's an actor, a teacher, and a musician. He's a member of the American Theater Critics Association, and he writes regularly for Broadway World and is a contributor for, of course, TrekMovie.com. He also writes the weekly Star Trekking newsletter on Substack. And this is This is great trivia. What an entrepreneur in fourth grade. He sold Tribbles to his classmates, and he wrote about his misadventures on StarTrek.com. As an adult, he's posted videos of himself playing Heading Out to Eden on ukulele, and I hope he brought his ukulele with him for today's conversation. So welcome aboard Enterprise Incidents, Neil Shirley. (laughs) Thank you so much, Scott. And I'm so sad that I did not bring a ukulele because that would have been um, better. But um, yeah, that was one of my favorite things to do was (laughs) record myself singing that song. I had to scour the internet to try to find some some chords, but I found it in like a PDF of an old um, Star Trek song book from (laughs) the early 70s that they used to pass around at at cons. And uh, yeah, it's a joy. So anyway, and it's a real joy to be here, by the way. Well, Neil, the first question for you is, what was the Star Trek episode that lit your fuse? And second question is, why was it so important for you to join us for The Way to Eden? (laughs) Well, I, you know, it's so far back in my memory now, I can't remember anymore what my first episode was. It would have been in second grade, um, watching it on TV after school. I'd come home, get some grape Pop-Tarts and uh, (laughs) and a glass of Welch's grape juice and uh, sit in front of the TV and watch Star Trek as well as Gilligan and Brady Bunch and all the other stuff. But um, there was just something wonderful about Star Trek. And uh, whatever my first episode was, it was relatively early in the first season because I remember that feeling of seeing the first repeat for me. And it was, um, yeah, I don't remember exactly which one it was, uh, but probably somewhere around Conscious for the King, but not that one. I think maybe Conscious with the, of the King was the last one that was quote unquote new 
to me. But um, yeah, it's it, it, it just has been near and dear to my heart ever since then. And then as far as this episode, there's just something so wonderful and memorable about the space hippies. Um, as goofy as they are and as goofy as a concept as they are, they have just always kind of resonated in my dumb little heart. Um, they're, they're, you know, we reach and yelling Herbert at each other, you know, the, 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 the times that I've called people a Herbert, I I lost count over the years, but it's (laughs) just, um, you know, it's just one of those simple, silly joys of remembering, yeah, the space hippies. So whenever people are putting it down, I'm always thinking, yeah, but it is, but hey, they sing and woohoo, it's Spock digs music. Come on, look, he's playing along with them. Anyway, we'll get into that later. Well, you know what? I got to tell you, Neil, when when Steve and I first started Enterprise Incidents, you know, we really hit the ground running because even though the early episodes of the original series, you could see that that they're really finding their way, especially with Nimoy playing Spock. But, you know, we had so many great episodes to cover right off the bat, like where no man has gone before and Balance of Terror and so on. So mm-hmm. I just remember thinking in the back of my head with all these conversations with my good friend, Steve Morris, like, what's going to happen when we get to the way to Eden? And <laughs> here we are. So, Steve, I've been kind of like burying the lead here with asking you this question. But what have you thought about the way to Eden over these years? And what do you think of it? Maybe that's we're about to jump into this convo. So obviously it was never one of my favorite episodes. Yeah, sure. I never... I never hated it the way that I hated and the children shall lead. And I certainly didn't respond to it the way things that we, some of the ones that we did recently, like whom gods destroy and some of the episodes like that. I found the hippies kind of amusing. And I think the weird thing for me is I grew up with hippies because I grew up in Marin County, California. I was born in 1968. Both of my parents went to Berkeley. I went to Cal football games as a kid. I was in Berkeley all the time. The camp, the camp counselors at Forest Farms, where I went to summer camp, were clearly ex hippies. Like there was a tree in my neighborhood called the Hippie Tree because so many hippies, you know, in Mill Valley, there were, you know, it's like that's what I grew up with. And so my relationship to weirdos with long hair who, you know, listened to crazy music and did weird things was like normal. And so the space hippies were sort of on the, on the one hand, kind of like just a normal thing. And, and I think my response watching it now is, man, I wish they had actually talked to an actual hippie before they wrote the show (laughs) because it's just so disconnected. But I'll tell you, you know, again, we had some really bad episodes in a row. And while I don't think this is a really good episode, it isn't one of the terrible episodes of Star Trek, as far as I'm concerned. It's just not a yeah. particularly good episode. That's that's how I feel about it. You, you know, it's funny you say that, Steve, because for all these years, for so many years, I, I really cannot remember the last time I watched The Way to Eden from start to finish. And you're right. Lately, we have, you know, this point in the third season, we have covered a few episodes of the original series that were not great at all, like Whom Gods Destroy, even though we actually do have a lot of fans of that one. But The Mark of Gideon is a big miss. Uh, watching, first of all, The Way to Eden is an episode that I always thought was different. I mean, there's certainly no other episode like it. So I always gave it points for that. But during my rewatch, I realized that, you know what? This is not a bad episode at all. I think if anything, it's misunderstood because my rewatch, I was like, I had a lot of epiphanies here, a lot of revelations about it that I never really got before because I never really thought of the original series as a complete arc like we have during our deep dive of the original series on Enterprise Incidents, you know, linking the whole series instead of just being episodic. But the one thing that I appreciated the most on my rewatch, and we'll get into this detail during the conversation, gentlemen, is this. The Way to Eden is a big swing, and (laughs) it's a double. It's a double. It's not a home run, but it is a double. And the reason I say that is because they went for something and they committed to it. They did not pull the punches on a great concept like the Mark of Gideon was a great idea, but it was a strikeout. You know, it didn't even hit like a a fly ball into left field. (laughs) It was a strikeout. This is a double because like like Neil brought up, I mean, maybe there isn't as much hippie stuff as you would think there is, but there's a lot going on here. The episode does commit and I appreciate it for committing the way it did. What is what is really incredible to, incredible to me is 
the start this episode had way back in its earliest outlines, it started off as something very, very different before turning into what it did. When the way this has always been, this has always been like part of the lore. I remember reading about and wondering about, oh my gosh, how different it could have been, you know, just growing up reading this stuff. But sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. no, I'm going to ask you about that. I'm going to ask you about Mm -hmm. this in a moment, Neil, because because The Way to Eden aired on February 21st, 1969. It was the 75th episode to air, but it was filmed between November. 21st, a key date in Star Trek history, as Steve Morris will will tell you about, between November 21st and November 29th, filmed on schedule in six days. It was the 76th episode to film, and it came in right about on target with its budget. The total cost of The Way to Eden was $177,165, which brought it just a little under... Uh, $1,200 under its budget. The score, I, now I mentioned how the last like proper score was recorded for Plato's Stepchildren, but Fred Steiner did record a little bit of music here for, for the last act. And of course, you have all that new original music, the soundtrack, you could say, of The Way to Eden, which was recorded on November 20th, 1968. But uh, the episode was directed by David Alexander. It was the second of two episodes, the the first one being Plato's Stepchildren. So David Alexander had the pick of the litter with directing some of these these classic Star Trek episodes. (laughs) The original story was written by Dorothy Fontana, but she was so disillusioned with working with producer Fred Freiberger on the development of this episode that she actually had her pseudonym used as Michael Richards. Teleplay was written by Arthur Heinemann, uh, who wrote the, the screenplay or the teleplay for Wink of an Eye. Now, when Dorothy Fontana wrote her story outline, and which was dated July 11th, 1968, it was called Joanna and Neil Shirley. I'm betting you know the answer to why the early outline by Fontana was called Joanna. I do. As I say, I feel like it was kind of a legendary thing that that Dorothy Fontana was excited about introducing us to Dr. McCoy's daughter, Joanna. Um, And as I remember, the legend, at least, was that Fred Freiberger thought that Kirk and McCoy were peers, and therefore uh, McCoy was not old enough to have a grown daughter. And so things changed. Well, that is actually true. You are absolutely right. Fred Freiberger thought that yes. McCoy and Kirk, yes, uh, he knows his, uh, the way to eat and stuff. Uh, so uh, uh, Fred Freiberger thought that Kirk and McCoy were the same age. Um, but I just want to read the first memo that Dorothy Fontana wrote to Gene Kuhn on January 24th, 1968. The USS Enterprise stops at a star base to pick up new medical personnel being transferred to duty aboard. As the group of doctors and nurses beam aboard, McCoy and Kirk greet them in the transporter room. One of the women, a lovely dark-haired woman in her th- in about, 19, about 20 years old, takes one look at McCoy and flings herself into his arms, much to Kirk's surprise. Then McCoy turns to Kirk, grimaces, and introduces nurse Joanna McCoy, his daughter. That uh, original pitch evolved. And actually, uh, DeForest Kelly loved the idea and suggested that it be it, it, it went from being McCoy's son to his daughter. But as uh, Fontana progressed through the development stages, her revised outline on August 27th was titled The Way to Eden. And then Arthur Heinemann came in and proceeded to a second draft teleplay by November 11th, Arthur Singer, the story editor for the third season, did his script polish, his final draft on November 12th. And then Fred Freiberger, producer of the third season, did his script polish, his second revised final draft on November 18th. Now, Fontana- Can I, can I jump in for a sec? Yeah, um, sure. So what's interesting to me about that opening, and by the way, I think this is a way better episode with McCoy's daughter. I think that is a much better yeah. idea, and I'll explain why. But what that opening is that you just described- is another DC Fontana script because it is Journey to Babel. Yes, it is. Mm. Yes, it is. Except instead of, oh, surprise, it's my parents, it's surprise, it's my daughter. 
You know what, yeah. Steve? Can you imagine this episode, Joanna and Neil? Can you imagine if like Fontana had like taken this to the limit and written this for the second season? Maybe when Gene Kuhn was still calling the shots, that would have been a hell of a screenplay oh or a gosh, hell of an episode. It could have been something else, uh, yeah. But when when uh, when Fontana was was still in the development stages of the Way to Eden, she actually suggested having, and this is a uh, kind of crazy, either Nancy Sinatra or Bobby Gentry play Joanna. Um, that would have been really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> but in an effort to appeal to a younger audience, in addition to Fred Freiberger not having uh, the ages right for Kirk and McCoy, Freiberger changed. Uh, the character to McCoy's daughter, from McCoy's daughter to Chekhov's Russian ex-girlfriend. And that is when Fontana begged her agent to get her out of Star Trek. It's Mm. so much of a better idea with McCoy's daughter because the whole, this is a generational conflict or it should be a generational conflict because this is about the older, more conservative, militaristic, you know, World War II generation dealing with the hippie generation, with the baby boomers. And so it had been McCoy and his daughter. That fits perfectly. And, of course, that's not what it ends up being. <laughs> right. Ugh. So would you like to know some of the things going on in the world between November 21st and November 29th, 1968? Well, let's hear it, Steve Yes. Well, you gave a little hint, Scott, because a critical moment in Star Trek history happened in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, on November 21st, 1968, and that is the birth of the great Scott Mance. Yes! Welcome to the world, (laughs) Mr. Mance. Thank you so much, gentlemen, and I just got to say that by the time this episode drops, uh, it'll be that time uh, in November where I get to celebrate another milestone, another another trip around, around the sun, and... So I always looked at Plato's stepchildren being my birthday episode because it aired the day after I was born on November 22nd, 1968. But in fact, The Way to Eden is my birthday episode because it started filming on November 21st. Scott, it's almost as if you were born directly out of Dr. Severin's egg. (laughs) Oh my goodness. (laughs) Shocking and terrifying thought, Neil Shirley. But (laughs) <laughs> um, there are a few other things that also went on in the world, but I don't think any of them are quite as important. But on November 22nd, it's so funny because some of these things actually relate to the episode that we just did, which is the Cloudminders, is in uh, Great Britain, there were five proposed reforms to deal with the violence and the discrimination against Roman Catholics in Northern Ireland. And it's another example of a group being treated differently, and they have different economic prospects and different lifestyles because they are sec- um they are uh, separated out. Um, and then Scott Mance, there is an, a very important event in Beatles history on November 22nd, 1968. Now that I know for sure, because November 22nd, 1968 is the day that the Beatles double album known as the white album came out. And what an album that is an album that is absolutely all over the place with 33 songs, no cohesion whatsoever. Really, uh, the, the a Beatles album that captures the revolutionary spirit of 1968 uh, when it came out on November 22nd. Absolutely fantastic Beatles album. One of my favorites. So this um, is so totally tangential, or, or but but the White Album to me had always been yeah, I like this song and I like that song, but it you know it never gelled together a lot. But then again, I never really sat through and listened to it all at one time and i did that last year and it's a surprisingly wonderful listening experience to just sit and listen to the whole thing flip the side of the lp play the other side and listen to it that way it really uh, is remarkable and uh, i loved it a lot more than than i remembered loving it you you know the thing about the thing about the white album is that that after the beatles recorded sergeant pepper's lonely hearts club band which i see as as the, the last true album that they really did work together as a unit as a group, you know you have that album which which feels like a a, a whole a, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts because there's a co- cohesion to it. And then you get to the White Album about a year and a half later where it is all over the place and 
And back in 68, when the album came out, it got kind of mixed reviews because of that. But, but what, what in fact was great about it was 68 was such a tumultuous year with all the riots and the death of Martin Luther King and the assassination of Bobby Kennedy and so on and so on, that the chaotic feel of the White Album acted as a perfect soundtrack to the year itself. But I agree with you 100%, Neil. Sorry to digress in Beatles, but that's my other (laughs) obsession. Listen, I don't think it's ever a digression to talk about the Beatles on this show. Um, (laughs) As you mentioned, uh, Scott, also on the 22nd is that Plato's Stepchildren aired, which is largely to believe to be the first interracial kiss on TV. And I think we've discussed many times that it's not really even the first interracial kiss on Star Trek. But but it did air then. On November 23rd, uh, Lynn Susan was crowned homecoming queen at the University of Houston. She was the first African-American student ever to be given that honor in the American South. And University of Houston had only been integrated seven years earlier. And this, again, it's like, we're talking about the cloud minders, access to education, access, you know, a group denied access to something environmentally that could help them. And then tragically, I also read that uh, Lynn Susan was stabbed to death in a car in 1971, Ooh, wow, just three God. years later, which is absolutely terrible. I don't know any more details of that. I do, however, know a, another detail of the game that was played at the University of Houston, where they set a record by beating Tulsa 100 to 6. Holy Toledo. <laughs> Yeah. That's a massacre. Dang. Yeah. And and again, we continue news stories that relate, I think, to Star Trek, which is that on November 24th, uh, Eldridge Cleaver, who was a civil rights leader and a Black Panther, had his parole revoked. So he was about to be, he was going to be paroled. And then at the last minute, they said, no, no, you're going to have to serve prison time. And he fled the country. And I just went, man, Eldridge Cleaver and Loki and Vana have a lot in common. Wow. Um, yes. um, and then we've also been discussing, uh, obviously, the war in Vietnam and the presidential election. And on November 26, the president of South Vietnam did reversed himself and did agree to go to the peace talks. This is now three weeks after the election in the United States. And whether or not he had refused at first because of urging by Nixon or changed his mind at this moment, I don't know. But he did finally enter the peace talks with North Vietnam. Shall we get into the way to Eden? Are you ready, Neil Shirley? Yeah, we reach, brother. <laughs> so uh, it's funny, much like Let That Be Your Last Battlefield, we're chasing a, a ship that is not responding to us. We have we try to hail them, and we ask Lieutenant Ohura, oh, that's not Lieutenant Ohura. No, that is not Lieutenant Ohura. So first of all, you mentioned that the episode kind of starts like Let That Be Your Last Battlefield. There, in, in that episode, they were chasing a stolen shuttlecraft. But also, Steve, I'm going back to one of the earliest episodes of Star Trek, Mud's Women, sure, where oh we are God. chasing a ship uh, into an asteroid field, and uh, same same sort of uh, progression of of stakes as as the Enterprise is trying to to get survivors off that ship. But as Steve pointed out, that is not Nichelle Nichols as Uhura in the communication seat. That is once again. Elizabeth Rogers, who played Lieutenant Palmer in the Doomsday Machine. So she went from being in like what is one of the greatest of all the <laughs> all episodes time greatest, yeah. to one of the worst. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, when when I rewatched this, I rewatched the the high def version, but I also dug out my old DVD to watch kind of the original version and was reminded um, right up top that um, one of the things that always struck me about the episode originally was how obviously the model they originally used was the Tholian ship with a couple of nacelles stapled on. Um, so, but, and there were some, and you know, it's nice that there's a new ship in the, in the remastered version, but I kind of, I kind of like seeing the altered Tholian ship. It was kind of fun to watch it again. Though. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you brought that up. Yes, that's right. Well, and, fr- and frankly, no offense to the people who did the remasters who we've said most of the time did a really great job. I don't think these effects, I don't think the ship looks particularly great. I don't think these effects look particularly great in this sequence. Um, I'm, I'm in agreement with you, Alice. You guys have mentioned before, I think, of how, or, or, or in one of your conversations, someone was just talking about how by the time it, when they were doing the remaster that they had basically lost all their budget to 
even remaster stuff by the time they were getting to this episode. So I guess yeah. it sort of shows. <laughs> um, and so it, it, it's funny. It is very much Mud's women. It's very much, it's let that be your last battlefield. No response. We put a tractor beam on. They're still trying to escape. Their ship is overheating. We're going to beam them aboard. And of course, and I like, by the way, that as they put maximum power on the tractor beam, that the lights dim on the bridge. So this is yep. really putting a strain on the Enterprise. And at the last minute, of course, we beam them aboard. Scotty. Are they aboard? They are. And a nice lot, too. And a nice lot, too. I remember seeing this episode for the first time vividly because it is such a different episode. So I was watching Star Trek and syndication mostly on Channel 17 in Philadelphia, That's how the announcer used to say it. And it was on at 7 o'clock p.m., five nights a week. And then in about 1978 or 79, it moved to 1130 at night, which was so late. Uh, But I was able to record the episodes on a timer thanks to my brand spanking new Betamax. Uh, My my dad (laughs) thought – my dad was so cutting edge. He got a Betamax over over the VHS. He said the quality was better, and he was right. Um, But – I remember this Friday night, I was able to stay up because it was Friday night. And uh, I remember Scotty's words when he goes, yeah, they are. And what a fine lot, too. So that was how te- the teaser for The Way to Eden was brought to a close. And we come back in Act One. And what we hear is that we can't actually throw all these people in the brig because one of them is the son of an ambassador. And so they have to kind of treat him with kid gloves. Scotty, take them to the briefing room. We are not in the mood, Herbert. And at that moment, Chekhov looks up and says, Irina? You know, Walter Koenig did have a lot to do in the shorter time that he was on Star Trek. I mean, you know, when you look at his his placement, his his involvement, his contributions to episodes like Who Mourns for Adonais, uh, you know, and then you have the Game Search for Skellion, and then the beginning of the third season as far as First episode shot for season three was Spectre of the Gun, which is an awesome episode. And even though I would say that The Way to Eden doesn't completely work, it is really, really nice to see Walter have another great storyline. And I think he's actually quite good in this episode. I think so, too. Go, 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 Which one of you is Tongo Rat? And this purple-haired, surly guy comes up to Kirk. So Tom Go Rad is played by Victor Brandt. Now, does the face of Tom Go Rad look a little familiar to you, Neil? No, I don't think so, except as Tom Go Rad. Well, it's hard to kind of put the face with the, the makeup uh, because he does look so fundamentally different. But uh, Victor Brandt played the security guard Watson in A Land of Troyes. Uh, who was killed Ooh, in engineer? Oh, uh, okay. So the same actor, uh, but he was also on TV shows like Gomer Pyle, uh, The Rookies, the Zorro TV series, and on film, he was in movies like Another Forty Eight Hours, Sliver, and The Santa Claus Two. But yep, that's uh, that's Watson. Wow. You know, Scott mentioning Gomer Pyle reminds me that TV shows at, at that time they using the hippies as a as a statement as an antagonist as a way to frame against your quote unquote norms was happening a lot there was a gomer pile episode where uh like rob reiner i think played one of the hippies in that versus gomer pile of course there there you know there'd been that dragnet episode where the hippies were on lsd and they put their baby in the microwave or whatever you know the, <laughs> the danger of hippies um so I, I think there there was a lot of this going around at that time that it it was a big it was a big movement the hippies sure of course and you know uh the uh just worth noting that in season 2 of Star Trek Gomer Pyle clobbered Star Trek in the ratings <laughs> week after week so you have this uh show Gomer Pyle which which got double the ratings that Star Trek got but when was the last time you went to a Gomer Pyle convention I'm just saying <laughs> it's been a long time that's for sure and Kirk kind of comes down on Tongo Rad telling him all the things that he could be arrested for if it weren't for his father's influence and Tongo's response is I'm bleeding he's such a jerk and and it's funny because <laughs> you know Lokai is a jerk too, 
But Lokai is clearly expressing a political opinion, you know, like, well, I had to do that because of this, whereas Tongo is really not. He's the entitled son of, an, of, a, yeah. of a diplomat, right? In addition, you've caused an interstellar incident which may have destroyed everything that's been negotiated between your planet and the Federation. You've got a hard lip, Herbert. <laughs> We're going to see the, hear this Herbert thing a lot. <laughs> Kirk asks for an explanation, and he just crosses his arms and sits. Captain, with your permission. And he walks forward, and he makes this gesture with his hands. One. We are one. One is the beginning. So let me ask you a question, Neil. Why do you think that Spock related to the hippies? So one of the things I realized in rewatching this was, and, and again, kind of going towards your thesis of growth all the way across the the series that we're really seeing Spock's, um, you know, what something that always stood out to me from the very, one of the very early Blish uh, books, like on the back cover, it would describe the Spock as having cat-like curiosity. Um, and that phrase has always kind of stuck with me. And I think this is another one of those where we're seeing Spock has a lot of curiosity about things that are different, that Spock is a seeker himself, that he that there is a spiritual um, seeking, questing side to Spock. And I think, strangely, this whole episode sort of prefigures what we're going to see Spock do later when he encounters V'ger, uh, uh, and it's sure. like, oh, you know, everything, uh, you know, they, he was reaching and and couldn't find the, the answers, and 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 then even maybe this leads to uh, you know, partially just illogical humans, but maybe specifically this is another step towards why he uh, studied Colinar to try to find a way to to bring all this together in his own mind. I don't know, but it, it's just. I think there's a lot more you can bring to these episodes as than you might originally think. So first of all, Neil, I think that's a great thought. And I totally like that idea of Spock as a seeker and connecting. I love that you connected that the motion picture. I think that's great. And this to me is both shows the potential that this episode could have been. And what I think is the biggest fundamental problem with what it is, which is that it is, in an episode like Let That Be Your Last Battlefield or The Cloudminders or going back to this side of paradise, you have people that passionately believe in a thing that maybe the crew of our enterprise doesn't believe in. Or in the case of Loki and Vana, they, they can be pretty abrasive and difficult to deal with. And their methods maybe are methods we don't agree with. But it's very clear that they have a real reason behind what they're doing and that it's also very clear that the people who wrote and made the episode respect those reasons, even if they don't agree with the methods the people use. Mm -hmm. There mm -hmm. is no good reason. The, the, what the hippies, the space hippies believe in isn't a really interesting thing. It doesn't really make sense. And so if they had come up with something, and I think what this really comes from is it's, as you described, like Dragnet episodes and the way that TV was portraying hippies at the time was extremely disrespectful. And they didn't go like, well, what are these guys really talking about? Do they have a point? Are they, have, are they after anything? If yeah. they had been more closely to what the actual hippie movement was and going, hey, we're anti-war, we're anti-violence, we're peaceful, we believe everybody should share, we believe, I mean, like the not having um, money and having a commune, well, that's what Roddenberry is going to say the Star Trek universe is later on anyway, because it's, you know, we don't have money and we don't have, we don't go after things for greed. If they had had a real philosophy that made a lot of sense, then Spock, who has always been the person resisting violence, and, res and, and looking for other ideas would have had a genuine thing to connect to them about. I was looking at some, I was looking at a couple of things uh, online earlier and I came across this article about the hippie movement from um, someone named Sarah Foreman. And she, in this, in her article, she quoted a professor named John Robert Howard who had written in 1969 that the hippies offered in 1966 and 67 a serious, though not well articulated, alternative to the conventional social system. That they assumed implicitly that what they created would be so joyous, so groovy, so dazzling that the straight would abandon his own uptight life and come over to their side. And it just felt like, yeah, that's exactly what these guys are doing. 
Well, first of all, I am super glad, Steve, that you brought up this side of paradise. Because just like the person who wrote the original story for The Way to Eden, who wrote this side of paradise? E.C. Fontana. Mm. Dorothy Fontana. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So Dorothy Fontana in This Side of Paradise, she did in a far more subtle way what The Way to Eden does in a way too Captain Obvious over the top way. She deals with the hippie movement because what are the colonists of Omicron SETI 3 doing? They are turning on, Mm. tuning in, and dropping out. They are, in a sense, hippies. But it's done in such a subtle way that it took me a long time to really wrap my head around that that's what that episode was, whereas there is nothing subtle at all about the way to eat. But as far as Spock goes, and again, this is what happens when you rewatch an episode that you have not seen in many, many, many years. You look at it differently. And I'll tell you, I'm looking at everything differently after doing all these, these deep dives with you, Steve, on Enterprise Incidents, is that I get that Spock connects with the hippies because in the late 1960s, when Star Trek was airing in its original run, Leonard Nimoy and Spock became the most popular character, even more so than Captain Kirk, because all the misfits and the, uh, uh, you know, sort of the loners really connected to Spock. They related to Spock because Spock represented being an outsider. So now here is Spock turning around and he's relating to these hippies that are outsiders. And the reason that Spock is able so easily to embrace or attempt to embrace with the hippies is because of the experience he had in this side of paradise. Then, Mm. you know, whether or not it was as a result of the spores, he was able to turn on, tune in and drop out and connect to the, the colonists of Omicron City 3. He got it. Now, then the spores wore off and he was devoted, uh, committed to that man on the bridge and he, he resumed his duties. But you don't have an experience like this side of paradise and shake it off completely. If he had not had that experience in this side of paradise, maybe he wouldn't have just walked up uh, to Severin and, and, and said one. He, maybe not. But he did have that experience. And also, he's been around humans a lot now during this five-year mission. So he's a little more, he's a little more uh, uh, relaxed with, with a, uh, uh, showing his appreciation for that side, just for the same way that he kind of was flirting with Droxine in the last episode we covered right. on the Cloudminders. There is a link and a progression to the evolution of Spock. And Spock embracing the hippies and in the way to Eden is just another step in that progression, leading, of course, to what Neil pointed out in the motion picture. Well, and also, is there something in the Vulcan psyche that that has this seeking aspect or something in his family? Because Spock's brother ultimately ends up doing the same thing as these hippies, going off looking for a mythical Eden planet, except it's got a different name. Yeah, it's okay. God. <laughs> Neil, you just earned the huge amount of money we're paying you to be on this show because <laughs> you not only connected motion picture, but for connecting Star Trek Five, that's pretty awesome. Well done. <laughs> very, very, very well done. That is very yes, true. I get it. Yeah, no absolutely. Pride. Spock um, has this brother that we're learning about what well, we learned about in Star Trek Five, but we're we're going to learn more about on Strange New Worlds. So that's another reason that while Spock never talks about Cybok. He has experience with this aspect of something that he doesn't actually take part in himself, which makes him, you know, again, embrace the hippies. So needless to say, though, when he makes this gesture and says one, there is a huge reaction among our hippies, including from this bald gentleman with very interesting ears who says we are one. And that gentleman is Severin, played by Skip Homer, who, you know, you take away the funky looking ears and the ball cap. Does he look familiar to you, Neil Shirley? He looks, he looks, I don't know, somewhat almost fascistic to me. I'm not sure what it is. There's just something strict about that face. I don't know. Oh, where have I seen this evil, evil person before? Something manipulative. Ah, oh, it's right there. I don't know. What, it's what could right it be? there. Patterns of force where yes, that's Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> to, 
to go from the Nazis to the space hippies is a, that's a, that is a long uh, journey <laughs> for characters that, that are journey. both jerks. Oh my gosh, that is the journey of mid-century America right there, going from World War II to the hippies, right there in one person. Look at there. <laughs> You're right. Um, <laughs> and and then this other guy, who is this sort of big dude, has a big smile and says, Are you one, Herbert? Oh, oh man, gosh. you know that face. Oh my oh gosh. My gosh. I, 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 that, now, before we get into where we've seen this face many, many, many times over the decades, this is Adam, the standout of the hippies played by Charles Napier. So, so before we get into his credits, Charles Napier actually did his own singing and co-wrote many of the songs, including head now to Eden and yeah, looking for brother. a new brother <laughs> and looking for a new land. So he really committed to his character and it's one of his first credits uh, on, on Star Trek in uh, the way to Eden, but on TV, he was also in shows like mission impossible BJ and the bear uh, murder. She wrote, he returned to Star Trek in Deep Space Nine in the great episode, Little Green Men, which I love. But did you know, did you know this gentleman? And to all the Enterprisers listening to our Enterprise Incidents podcast, that Charles Napier was the uncredited voice of the Hulk in The Incredible Hulk. I never knew that. I did, uh, know, that. Uh, I, I did know that he's the leader of the good old boys in the Blues Brothers. Well, I mean, and not only is he the leader of the good old boys in the Blues Brothers, where he's going to knock out your effing teeth, uh, he was also the baddie in Rambo First Blood Part 2. He was in okay. Ernest Goes to Jail. I know that's one of the uh, many episodes of Ernest that Steve covered on The Cinephiles. Yeah, and he was ooh. also in The Silence of the Lambs and Philadelphia. I mean, the guy's had an amazing career. Oh my gosh, yes. I remember seeing him in Blues Brothers, and that was kind of the first time that he popped out at me again after uh, seeing him only in The Way to Eden and just immediately thinking, oh, wow, yeah, that guy, hey! And uh, and because of The Way to Eden, every time I see him, I have, I think of that kind of goofy, warm-hearted presence that he brings to Adam, so it's always hard for me to see him as the kind of the mean disciplinarian kind of guy that he often played in uh, in other shows. And, and I just want to point out that there are times that actors are called upon to do things that maybe aren't that great. And it isn't easy to commit 100% to doing that thing. And man, Charles Napier 100% commits to every single thing he does in this episode even when I think some of those things aren't necessarily that great. <laughs> Absolutely. He is impossibly charismatic in this, I think. And even in that very first scene where they're shouting no go or whatever, he is the one who's really kind of moving a lot more and just really getting into it where the other guys are just sort of sitting there and chanting. But he's already, even at that point in the episode, he's already bringing a little extra to it. It's, it's funny because Dr. Severin's the big bad guy and Arena has the love story and Adam steals the show. I, absolutely absolutely i am not herbert he's not herbert we reach as if all reach. you have to do is say we say these words and then we all agree and he goes yeah we reach <laughs> um by the way when you hear we reach have either of you read uh robert heinlein's stranger in a strange land never i have but it's been many years the word that comes from robert heinlein which i just checked was written in 1961 the word that comes from that book is grok we grok. Yeah. I grok. Yeah. You grok. I I am a hundred percent certain that we reach is their version of grok. Mm, that makes sense. Yep. And by a hundred percent, I what I actually mean is I have no idea, but that's the guess that I'm making. <laughs> um, if you will state your purpose and your objectives, perhaps we can arrive at a mutual understanding. If you understand one, you know our purpose. And we hear that they are looking for the planet Eden. I don't think this makes sense. I just, it just like if the idea was we want to live an agrarian, non technological life like this side of paradise, totally makes sense. Mm. And then you give them a strong motivation. But that, but there, there is some specific planet named Eden. I don't understand what that is. Are they saying Adam and Eve were came from a different planet? Are they, I don't, it just, it's so bizarre. And I think it detracts from the episode. I, I you know, I, I actually like that they've taken, obviously Eden, the Garden of Eden, and turned it into like the prospect of this is a planet that actually exists and that that 
you know, it's, it's a myth, you know, it's, but, but if, what if we can prove that it actually exists? I mean, it's a stretch and we reach, well, but Hey, but it, what if they said, you know, there's, there's been this, there is a theory. There's so many different species that are similar spread around the galaxy. And there's a theory that we all come from the similar place, that there's one source of origin, one planet that we call Eden. And that planet is Eden. And then it would connect to return to tomorrow and a bunch of other thing and, and whom mourns for modern eyes and like these ideas. And then you would go, Oh, that makes sense. I get it. As opposed to what it is now, which I don't think makes sense. But it, it was something that made enough sense to William Shatner for him to go further into the final <laughs> frontier uh, for yeah. Star Trek five. I mean, it's, True. it's not, right. I mean, who would have thought who would have just like, just like the motion picture, was a basically a remake of the Changeling. Who would have thought that they would have like, hey, you know what? If we're going to go back and sort of do a least remake of an episode from the original series, let's do a remake of The Way to Eden. Yeah, Star Trek V is real now. <laughs> we do not recognize Federation regulations nor the existence of hostilities. We recognize no authority save that within ourselves. Well, whether you recognize authority or not, I am it on the ship. I actually really like the way Kirk says that. He's like, well, whether you're not, you recognize authority, I am it. Like, I like, you know what? This is the Kirk that we love. Get off my ship. <laughs> right. Um, and he tells them that because of, you know, this kid, son of the ambassador, that they're not prisoners, but guests. And their response is, oh, Herbert, you are stiff. <laughs> and not for the last time, Kirk just kind of passes the buck to Spock. So Spock, you seem to understand these people. You will deal with them. And as Kirk Exits, they chant Herbert, 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 Herbert. We're back on the bridge. Sir, I believe I know one of them. At least I think I recognize her voice. Her name is Irina Galilean. We were in Starfleet Academy together. One of those was in the Academy. Again, this is where I feel like the episode could have been stronger, is and it definitely would have been stronger if that was McCoy's daughter rather than Chekhov's girlfriend. But like wh what they're setting up is this generational conflict, total disrespect on the older generation for the direction the younger generation has taken. And the way this show goes is that essentially the older generation is right and the younger generation is wrong. As opposed to being a Star Trek episode where Kirk had to learn something, is that they could still be doing something that's stupid, but also have a point, you know, that Kirk... Because, and the thing is, again, you know, because I'm a Berkeley guy, and this is where a lot of this movement started, is that it's people at university that learned deep stuff that made them look at our culture and our world and say, hey, this doesn't always make sense. We could do something different. Now, there's all sorts of problems with the hippie movement, and I, we could have long conversations about them, particularly as we move into the late 60s and early 70s. But but like the the idea that, hey, maybe war is bad and violence is bad and, you know, having to behave in exactly the way you're told to isn't a good thing and free expression is maybe good. Those are actually interesting ideas that I wish we were engaging with in this episode. But, but as Steve, I, to think, I think that we're engaging in those in those qualities in 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 ways that that are, are a little more subtle, especially when you when you look at the body of work of the original series, because now for the second time in just a few episodes, we're establishing that Kirk is the establishment, okay? Because remember, and let that be your last yeah, battlefield, go into that episode yet again. Why, which, between Beale and Loki, who did Kirk respect more? Well, right. he certainly associated more with Beale, absolutely. But but that but the difference is is that in Let That Be Your Last Battlefield, you have Beale and Loki, so that you're actually seeing both sides of the thing with Kirk not representing both sides. And it's very clear in that episode that we have sympathy for Loki, even if right. we, even if he's a jerk and doing terrible things because of his cause. Um, and that's not the case here. She dropped out. You wish to see her? Permission to leave your post. Thank you, sir. What do you think of Kirk's response on this, uh, Neil? <laughs> see, I wrote down a little thing right here uh, about how much I really appreciated the Kirk's kind of paternal hand on on um you know squeezing Chekhov's arm and just a little bit of a smile like yeah 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 go ahead i understand go ahead and and, and go talk to him it, it it uh i don't know it felt nice to me i kind of liked it what i always liked about Chekhov 
was the paternal relationship that he had with Kirk. I think that was really on display uh, at its best, this most fully realized depiction of this in Who Mourns for Outer Nights. And then I have to say that in the third Kelvin timeline Star Trek movie, Star Trek Beyond, uh, I really appreciated the way uh, Simon Pegg and Doug Young, who wrote that screenplay, uh, evolved Kirk and Chekhov in that timeline in the same possible way. But but I felt like you know we hadn't seen this relationship between Kirk and Chekhov at least since since uh, Spectre of the Gun. So I was I was happy to see that return. Yeah. Do they really believe that Eden exists? Many myths are based on truth, Captain, and they are not unintelligent. Their leader, Dr. Severin, is a man... Dr. Severin is their leader. And Kirk has an immediate reaction to Dr. Severin. Yes. A brilliant research engineer in the fields of acoustics, communications, and electronics on Tiburon. I just have to point out that the name of the town that I grew up in, that my mom still lives in, is Tiburon. Wow. So every single time I heard (laughs) that, I was like... That's where I come from. Uh, it, it's kind of just outside San Francisco, right? So is this a deliberate nod to, yeah. hey, this is, I mean, I don't know Tiburon, but is this, this is where Squaresville is compared to um, Haight-Ashbury? I don't know. Well, the, the, the city that's directly next to Tiburon <laughs> is Mill Valley. And Mill Valley is definitely a center of hippiness. <laughs> also the birthplace of BJ Honeycutt, but that's an entirely different thing. Uh, totally different show. And we hear that he was dismissed of his post. And then we also hear that this is an accomplished group of people, including Tongo Rad. And then Spock has even this kind of poetic line. They hunger for an Eden where spring comes. But uh, we don't steal space cruisers and act like irresponsible children. And this is where, as Neil, as you brought up, is Kirk asks Spock why it makes him so interested. Mm-hmm. And this is where he talks about curiosity. A wish to understand. They regard themselves as aliens in their own world, a condition with which I am somewhat familiar. And, in fact, he has sung about that exact condition. Because on the album, Leonard Nimoy presents Mr. Spock's music from outer space. One of the songs is called Alien, in which he sings, From the land of endless night come I. An alien from afar, spewing forth upon you a pleasant sphere, so much like you, and yet so unalike. Go and listen to that song. It, it, it's uh, uh, the first time I rewatched this. I almost felt like I was seeing a little smirk from from either um, Nimoy or Shatner. That it's like, oh yeah, I like that song you had on that album. But I'm sure it wasn't there. But still. <laughs> All right, Neil, when I said that you earned your pay before by bringing up Star Trek V, I was actually just kidding. You just earned your pay by bringing up the lyrics of a Leonard Nimoy album. Actually, for that, that Neil, you deserve awesome. a raise. <laughs> yes! A, we're doubling yes. your salary. <laughs> and then <laughs> Kirk kind of looks around, moves a little closer, and conspiratorially asks, What does Herbert mean? <laughs> it is um, somewhat... Um, Uncomplimentary, Captain. Herbert was a minor official, notorious for his rigid and limited patterns of thought. And what does Kirk respond? He thinks about it for a moment and he says, Well, I shall try to be less rigid in my thinking. So, Steve, you proved your point about Kirk learning and growing because he's already taking into consideration that he is too rigid. And he's too much of a Herbert, and maybe he needs to lighten up. Well, I'm glad you think that the point was proved. At any point in this episode, does he demonstrate less rigid thinking? Uh, I think by the very, very end of it, yes. I think he does. Uh, I don't really think so. I don't think we see him think about the other side or think about the hippie's point of view or try to I – don't, I don't see that happening in this episode. But, but, but when he allows Spock the time – and the help of Chekhov to locate Eden. I think that's just a little bit of a of 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 being less rigid. I a think little he's, bit. A little a bit. Little I bit. agree. Okay. I, I, I will concede that point. Um, uh, we are in sick bay, and we get the first of what will be many songs in the course of yes. this episode. Gonna leave. Sorry, the musical theater nerd in me kind of felt like there was just 
slightly an echo, a parallel uh, of um, of a song from Hair, which the original cast recording of that would have come out that summer before um, before this was written. And there there's a song in there about um, I got life, brother. Oh yeah. I got life, mother. I got life, sister. I got freedom, brother. I got good times, man. And there's just a little tiny hint of an echo there, but you could sort of see where some that's what was, you know, in in the air. You know what? I had never thought about it, but there's such a they totally listen to that album. There's mm-hmm. such a similarity mm-hmm. in the sound. And honestly, even the sound of his voice to the sound, I forget who it is, is on. I don't remember if what's in my head is the Broadway album or the movie album. Yeah. But like, there's a similarity in the in mm-hmm. the way that he sings. Yeah. But it's really fun to to watch them sing. I, I love that stuff. <laughs> I w- so this is just technically. So they, they obviously pre-recorded it and the actors lip sync on the set, which is kind mm-hmm. of what you normally do. And the fact that they have these instruments that don't really play the things that they're playing probably makes that necessary. Yeah. Uh, I think they over mixed it because it doesn't it really, really sounds very, very produced. Mm-hmm. And it kind of well, pulls me out. I was looking at the James Blish novelization of The Way to Eden. I decided I should read that, too, because what the heck? And um, I loved the little note at the end, at the uh, bottom of the page, the first time he um, lists the lyrics for one of the songs, Looking for the New Land. Um, He has a little footnote that says, I much regret that I cannot reproduce the music which went with this script. It was a very high quality. Oh, that's cool. So there you go. Well, the, the first of all, now that you're seeing all the hippies together again, since their appearance in the transporter room, you're getting a better look at two of the of the women in the hippie movement here. One of them is Deborah Downey, who didn't really have much of a of an acting career after she did Star Trek. She just uh, didn't feel like Hollywood was for her, but she did co-write some of the music here. And the other hippie who doesn't have a name, but you might recognize her face. Because she played Yeoman Mears in the Galileo Seven. That's Phyllis Douglas. Oh. Wow. Yeah, take I would a never look have at her. Go back and take her, yeah. a good look at her. Ah, and okay. you're like, oh my God, that's Yeoman Mears from the Galileo Seven. See, she was so traumatized by her experience uh, uh, in the, on the with Spock and the, the giant apes in the Galileo Seven. She's like, mm-hmm. you know what? This Starfleet thing isn't for me. So she 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 tuned out and became a hippie. There and they go. and she and still she ends up in that stupid shuttlecraft. Doesn't matter. That's her destiny. She kicked <laughs> That's away from funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and Chekhov enters looking for Arena. They say that she is getting her physical, and then we get this Adam strumming and say, "Gonna crack my knuckles and jump for joy. I got a clean bill of health from Doctor McCoy." And he wrote that himself. Yes. Pretty impressive. <laughs> it's fun. I, it is it's, fun. Uh, let me ask a general question of the two of you. How do you feel about these songs? I think they're actually pretty good. They're catchy. I remember them. I remember the tune. I remember the words. See, exactly that. That they that that, that they always just kind of stuck with me, for good or ill. They stuck with me. I, I like them. I really do. And I think I think, and I'm really glad you brought up the hair soundtrack. Is that because frequently what happens, and I think it's definitely true in the dialogue and the ideas, is that when an older generation tries to write stuff for the the hip young people, it almost always falls totally flat on its face. Mm-hmm. And I think that's true of the dialogue. But the fact that they gave Charles Napier, and I don't don't remember the woman's name, Deborah Downey. Uh, Deborah Downey, and and had them write the music, it feels, it actually does feel, if not perfectly 1968 contemporary, it feels kind of in the ballpark for me, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, the, o- the only disappointing part is, and, and this kind of goes with all the singing scenes that I, um, it's like Charles Napier tries his best to kind of move around, but they're obviously they weren't spending a lot of money on choreography, which they could have maybe done something with. Um, and especially when you, you hear the story that Charles Napier got the part because he uh, he jumped up on on a desk and, and sang House of the Rising Sun. And th- that's what kind of landed the, the role for him. I wish I would have seen even more of that kind of energy. Ultimately, Yeah, but. sure. Sure. In comes Nurse Chapel. Is her hair a different color? Uh, it is a little bit darker, yes. <laughs> well, except um, for later when it magically changes again. But anyway, we'll get to that part. 
<laughs> yeah, sure. Um, and uh, and now it's time for Doctor Severin, and he is not happy about having to go get his exam. And they basically grab him and pull him away. And there is Irina, and she sees Chekhov and says, "Pavel Andreevich, I had thought we might encounter each other." So Irina is played by Mary Linda. I don't know how to pronounce the last name. Is it Rapoli or Rapoli? Uh, but anyway, so it's Mary Linda Rapoli. I'm sure one of the enterprisers listening will correct me in the comment section. She didn't have that much of an acting career, but she was on TV in One Life to Live and As the World Turns. In film, you can catch her in Cold Blood and in The Proposal, two very, very, very different films. <laughs> <laughs> And they're starting to talk, and all the hippies kind of surround them. And Chekhov goes, let's go outside. <laughs> yeah, I love when the crew, another crewman kind of comes into frame and gives Chekhov the eye. How could you do this to yourself? You were a scientist. And now, look at you. Look at yourself, Pavel. And it's not only clear that he's upset about what choices she's made, but he is embarrassed by her to be seen with her on the Enterprise. And she's mm-hmm. embarrassed by him. <laughs> yeah. You know, pointing out his uniform. <laughs> I am proud of what I am. I believe in what I do. Can you say that? Yes. And they get into this conversation. What Again, it's kind of what bothers me is they're very nonspecific about the reason she made the choices that she made. And it gets more into their relationship. Are you happy in what you do? Yes. Then I accept what you do. You even talk like them. What do you think of the chemistry between between Mary Linda and Walter Koenig? Good. I think it's good. What do you think? How about you, Neil? Yeah, I, it's 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 reasonable. They they seem you know, it works. It works well enough. Yeah, I think so too. I think they're actually pretty good together. I think that's one it's of not, the. It's not magic, episode. but I think it works well enough for this. Yep, I agree. And it's very clear. I think that Chekhov was really hurt by what happened, and it sounds as if she kind of just ghosted him is that the impression that you got that she just sort of disappeared on him yeah i think um, she walked i, I, she, I yeah, think she fine. bailed yeah. on him yeah, yeah she never called afterwards oh pavel you have always been like this so correct and inside the struggle not to be give in to yourself you will be happier do you think that's true of Chekhov, that he's always struggling to be correct <sighs> struggling i i think i think the fact that he's He's a bridge officer. I mean, we we saw him in Cat's Ball, which is actually a flashback episode because of what the start date was, proving that Chekhov was actually in the first <laughs> season of the original <laughs> series. Um, so Khan did find him. Okay. I, I think that, you know, he was young, but I think that he was, you know, he was in a, a very prominent position on the bridge. I think that he was probably a little insecure, but ultimately, ultimately very, very respected for him to be and stay where he was. Not only do I not see Chekhov as a person who's desperately trying to be correct, because, I mean, the guy who's desperately trying to be correct is not going to bring all that up all that stuff about Russia. He's pretty comfortable joking with people that are way more senior than him. That's what I was just going to say, is the, is the Chekhov I think of all the time is that kind of that opening scene of Trouble with Troubles. Yes, yeah. exactly. There you, know, you go. That's, that's, that's the Chekhov I, th- I think of all the time. So I don't see that as true, but I also don't see that as a tension that exists within this episode. I think saying, hey, express yourself, be free, and then having that actually be a conflict for Chekhov and him learning a thing in the course of this episode would have been interesting. But that's not so you so you have the line, but then you don't really deal with it. And again, it goes back to this thing I'm saying about like, well, what do the hippies really believe? And is there any value in the things that they think? Um, Yeah, I agree with you there. It um, it, it not played out as well as it could have been. And then as their scene between the two of them is ending, suddenly we hear yelling and the, all of the hippies are fighting to get past the red guys. And that's when Chapel comes out and that is the end of Act 1. It's Act 2 and Kirk and Chapel get past all the protesting hippies to what she says. I thought all the animals were kept in cages. Wow. <laughs> I just caught that line for the first time during my rewatch. I was like, wow, Chapel. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is the, oh, this is the, okay, I get it. The older generation is disrespecting the younger generation, but they never get called up on any of it. You know what I mean? That's just, that seems to be the viewpoint of the show. Yeah, they're they like animals. Uh, and they are, we go into sick bay where Severn is being held and McCoy 
explains that the reason he didn't want to check up is that he is the carrier from some terrible disease that could kill everybody if you're not vaccinated. That's, and I suddenly yeah, went Sithacacus novi. <laughs> right. And this is where I wrote down I I I that is I had the same reaction. It never occurred to me that like, oh, there's an argument about about whether or not you need to be immunized and Wow. Okay. This, exam <laughs> this examination is an infringement of my rights. And what we basically hear from McCoy is that Dr. Severin is basically typhoid Mary. He's not going to die from this disease, but he can affect everybody. And if you're not immunized, this thing is deadly. This is outrageous. You're not isolating me. You're imprisoning me. You invent the crime, find me guilty and sentence me. We come back outside and they're all sitting there with their hands in the one position and the one of the girls is talking to Sulu and says, You know what we want. You want it too. How do you know what I want? And she hands him, what is the thing? Is it an egg? Is it a rock? What is that? Yeah, she what is that, Neil? <laughs> yeah, that little egg looking rock symbol thing that, that they have, which is so disappointing because, you know, there are so many cool um symbols and jewelry ideas you can have out of star trek and i would love it if there was a cool um representation of the space hippies that i could wear but that dumb looking little egg shape where that they've painted white then with a little yolk in the middle and uh the infinity symbol in inside the egg and it just looks like a little hand-painted little piece of uh, nothing it's just not as awesome as i wish it would be <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> And I'm going to say it. I promise this is the last time I'm going to say it. It would be better if she actually were saying something to Sulu that he was interested in rather than saying, <laughs> you know, you're interested in it, you know? Right, right. Maybe laying out some specifics. And they announced Dr. Severn will be released when we think he is medically safe. And Adam jumps up and sings another little song. Stiff man putting my mind in jail And the judge bang the gavel and say no bail Gonna lick his hand and wag my tail I love the reaction. Like Kirk is like, he just like shakes his head, walks into yep. the turbo lift and everybody goes, Herbert, Herbert, Herbert. <laughs> Mr. Spock, I don't seem to be able to communicate with these people. Do you think you can persuade them to behave? And Spock agrees. And we're down at the brig and Spock is talking to Dr. Severin. I have no influence over what they do. And what I wrote down was January 6, question mark. Because here we have a leader saying, look, I don't influence what they do. I'm just saying this. I, I'm just saying these things, you know, uh, uh, I'm just saying they, that you could uh, take over the enterprise. I'm not saying they should. I'm not responsible for it. Wow. I don't know. It just seemed yeah. like some echoes. It, it's funny that it's it's funny that you said that because I hadn't decided whether to bring it up, but I had that thought in a later scene too, uh, which yeah. we'll get to. And I guess I will bring it up now. Uh, well, sorry, I don't want to get all political, but no, it just you know it just jumped out at me. You're speaking. Time. Wait, you're singing uh, Steve's language here. <laughs> Federation will never allow the colonization of a planet by criminals. If they persist, they will be so charged and forever barred from Eden. As I have been barred. Then you knew you were a carrier. Of course I knew. You're dealing with an episodes where, like Neil pointed out with his reaction, that actually resonates because of the pandemic and vaccines and carrying and spreading and and so on. And this this part here between Spock and Severin, I always found to be a little disturbing because Severin knew he was a carrier, but Severin's condition, you know, he is saying was because of the technology and the science. Right. Your science has infected me. Your science has infected me. That to me was a little unsettling. It was mm -hmm. unnerving to me. It always was, but more so now. But that is true because that's yep. what McCoy says. He says our sterilized mm -hmm. world created this particular disease. Right. Wow. That's so that's resonates. Yeah. So right after that line too, just, and I'm sorry, the music nerd in me, ju this jumped out this time when he says that your science has infected me. That's when a music cue jumps in. You've infected me. The cue is actually a laser daser from man trap, you know, the third season recording of it. But what I heard this time, all I could hear was 
the backing music of Khan's uh, Buried Alive speech. It has that very same feel to it. That mm. da, da, Yeah, you're right. Da, you're right. You build, that. build up. Of, and it just, uh, I don't know, it, it, it echoed to me there. I've done far worse than kill you. I've hurt you. And I wish to go on hurting you. The other revelation that I had while watching this moment, where you're not just dealing with a bunch of hippies and a leader, you're dealing with a leader who is a charismatic figure, who's charismatic enough to, to, to have people follow him blindly, blindly. Mm-hmm. Well, mm-hmm. Neil just brought up January 6th, which is something I never considered, but definitely agree with the correlation. But even though this episode was shot in November of 1968, after all these years, I had a, an epiphany about Severin and about the way to Eden that I never, ever thought about before. But is Severin Charles Manson? I literally had the same thought and I had to mm-hmm. look up, well, when exactly were the Manson murders? And of course, the, the next year. Yeah, you know. Huh. So, but I saw I had that same thought, Scott. It, it and again, it would have been really interesting. Not that <laughs> if they had been thinking that if this had been made after the Manson murders, right. I think this would have become a much more interesting and scary episode. Hmm. But clearly, he is a charismatic leader who is using these hippie, young hippies to further some pretty sick ideas for to him. further yeah. his own agenda. Do you think yeah. he? Do you think that Severin? This is a question for both you guys. Do you think that Severin really cares about the other the others who are with him? I don't. I. Oh, that's a good question. Not those specifically that those people. Uh, I, he's probably yeah. someone who wants to have acolytes, but he doesn't care necessarily about those specific ones. Well, as and long I think as it has- gets him to Eden. <laughs> I think he has a del- totally deluded fantasy of what Eden's going to be like. And I think they're part of it, but he also is totally doesn't care that they're all going to die, you know, because he's, he's put, he's absolutely, you know, blocked out the fact that he can infect all of them. And without immunizations, they're all going to die. And they mm-hmm. keep, by the way, they keep talking about the primitives. Are they trying to find a planet that's inhabited by primitive people? Well, if they're just trying to find Eden, Eden wasn't inhabited by anybody, (laughs) if you think about it, except Adam and Eve. Well, except that I don't know that this is Eden, because he says, what he says is, Only the primitives can cleanse me. I cannot purge myself until I am among them. Only their way of living is right. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, like, are the primitives who he's already with, and they just want, he wants them to get to Eden, or are there primitives on Eden? Eden, who will cleanse him of his of his disease. I think yeah, he maybe thinks he there's prim- it, primitives there. Right, that he thinks that Eden is some kind of unspoiled paradise where there is still a, an unspoiled civilization living. Um, yeah. That, yeah, will heal him because it they has don't have be. science. <laughs> it has to be because the next couple of lines are, Your very presence will destroy the people you seek. I shall go to them and be one with them. And together we shall build a world such as this galaxy has never seen. By the way, as they're having this conversation behind Spock, an extra walks by and he walks by so slowly. <laughs> it just, it's just something I noticed is like, <laughs> and I think it's because of the lens that Spock is in is that when he walked by at a normal speed, he just went by too quick. And so they said, just walk really, really slow. <laughs> but they totally jumped out at me at this time. Um, cut to the bridge where the first thing Spock says is, Dr. Severin is insane wow and that's the admit that that's really like a chilling like so after this time that spock had with severin just goes to kirk and said oh he's insane and this is also when spock asked for permission to look for eden which uh, with the assistance of Chekhov, with which kirk says fine Chekhov is an auxiliary control i don't quite know why that's where he has to help spock but that is where where he does <laughs> because the plot dictates it that's why. exactly right and uh he's doing his research and spock is in his quarters and there's a buzz and in comes adam am i crossing you and then he spots that vulcan loot on the shelf and he's real excited hey brother do you play yeah that's real now <laughs> I, all, all the hippie dialogue in this scene is just 
it's uh it's far out man <laughs> it is just... yeah man um i think it's kind of far out and fun to see uh, you know another look inside spock's quarters too it's always fun to just see what how they would dress that set for him yeah and after he tries to play the lute, he hands it to spock who plays it hey how about a session you and us, it would sound. <laughs> and speaking of sound, the tune that Spock plays, Neil, does that sound familiar to you? It feels like it was maybe uh, uh, something like when he was first noodling around on it in 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 that first uh, Charlie X. When he was in the yeah 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 in that episode right before he started or her started singing at him. Yeah, that's right. That was the opening uh, the okay. opening score, the opening cues to uh when when Uhura was playfully singing uh about Spock and then Charlie in the uh rec room of Charlie X. You know, great white captain upstairs, but he don't reach us. But uh would he shake on a session? I mean, we want to cooperate like you asked, so I'm asking. All right, I just want to say one thing. I had never realized until because it goes by so very fast how Adam referred to Kirk, the great mm. white captain. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Very interesting. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Is Adam a good guy? Yes. I think he's just being, he's, he, Adam is a good person. He just is uh, putting his faith into someone who was not a good person. It, it, it's complicated because he, he's got uh, that, that, hey, we all know how to be friendly, right? Just be friendly. And he is friendly, but he's kind of using that friendliness and that good naturedness to steer people potentially in the wrong direction. I think, and I think this is true to some degree of arena as well, is I think the intention of the show is that both of them are good people, but I don't think they actually do enough to make that real. I think both Irina and Adam do stuff that, you know what, it's clear that's not good. And they and they should know it's not good, which is so you're in the next scene. And it's funny. So Irina comes into auxiliary control to talk to Chekhov and she asks a bunch of questions about what it is and that, you know, we find out basically you can control the ship from here. And Mm -hmm. also that he's assisting Spock on looking for Eden and that they're really doing that, which she's surprised. And then we get into a little conversation about basically because auxiliary control has all this computer information. They tell you what to do, and you do what they tell you. No. We use our own judgment also. I could never obey a computer. So we're sort of into a little bit of, you know, the ultimate computer and how much do computers control our lives or not control our lives. And I Mm -hmm. think that's interesting. You could never listen to anyone. You always had to be different. Not different. What I wanted to be. Which I really like. It relates to what she was saying to Chekhov before. Mm -hmm. And as this scene has been progressing, they've been moving closer and closer. And I do feel real kind of romantic sexual tension between the two of them. Yep, I do too. Yeah, and we finally end up in a big kiss, and who calls right in the middle of their kiss but Mr. Spock Mm -hmm. doesn't know why Chekhov doesn't respond so i have to admit that especially when i was watching this in the high def version that i was super distracted by Chekhov's hair because yeah because the yeah, part in his hair go starts all the way in the back of his head just like this um 87 year old man at my church who dyes <laughs> his hair and it's and he's got really long hair that starts at the very back of his skull and he combs it all the way forward. It was, I don't know. It's all I could see when I looked at Chekhov in this episode, especially in that scene. I was noticing that too, yep. which is, you know, the high definition of it all. And right. you, know, you can see, you'd see that, that, that Walter Koenig is like, you know, combing his hair forward, starting from like the back of his head versus yeah. like, you know, the top of yeah. his head. Yeah. We're in the rec room, and in comes Tongo, who says... His name is Sulu, specialist in weapons and navigation. His hobby is botany. Ken? Ken. I reach botany. It's my favorite of studies. What's yours? Vulcan. Spock is practically one now. And then Arena enters and tells them everything that uh, she found out about auxiliary control and says, we can do it. And what I find interesting about this is, in a way, this is... Uh, by any other name, because each of them has split up and is taking on one important person in their plan to take over the ship, you know? Mm, mm-hmm. 
Um, but I also go, this is where, well, Irina is clearly planning on stealing the Enterprise, you know, like, and so is Adam. Yeah. We should all go out and try to swing as many as possible over. You suggest any special ways to swing them? Just be friendly. You know how to be friendly. Then they'll be friendly. And from there, we cut to Severin in his cell, smiling. And that's the end of Act Two. And this is where I go, if I felt better about the hippies' motivations, and I was more involved with Adam I wouldn't, and Arena, I wouldn't be fa- having this feeling like, oh, they're bad guys. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. As much as I do, I want. I think it would be better if I if they were either more clearly duped by Severin, or more had more clear positive motivations or desires to protect the crew of the Enterprise. I, I don't. I don't disagree with any of that. I completely agree with you, but I still see enough of of Arena and Adam to think that they're. Yeah, I mean, sure, they should definitely know better and know that this is bad, what they are doing. Maybe if there was more of a stake than, you know, just finding Eden. But I still think that uh, that they're, they're, they are good people and they're just being manipulated by the wrong person. Like I said, yeah. I think that's the intention. Yeah. 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 Does this speak to the idea, though, that that people are not as black and white as we would like them to be motivationally? We, you know, people who we see doing what we think of as evil deeds. They aren't, they aren't necessarily, I'm an evil person. It's, uh, sure. you know, these are, these are good people who are sort of, yeah, well they're inside. They're justifying their own actions because, Hey, we're going to go to Eden. It's, it's great. It's great. This is good for everybody because yeah, you know, everyone will, will reach at that point. How do you guys feel about a jam session? Let's hear it. Let's open Act 3 with a jam session. Yay, brother! Long time back when the galaxy was... What's so funny is, like, so they're saying that the Space Hippies, they're kind of a band, right? Because sure they are. It's they're not just that, like, they're people that like to play music together. They're absolutely a band. They all have a part. They all... And they... they, they they play well together. <laughs> and apparently they're they're playing the music over the whole SIPs PA. So everyone's listening. <laughs> there's a guy, there's a red guy on the bridge who's yeah. bouncing along to the music. It's who's terrible. <laughs> yeah. Severin is listening, smiling in his cell. And I like there's even a moment where, you know, the they the background jumps up and they've got dance moves and choreography that they're doing. It's mm-hmm. it's, it's a little bit, yeah. Again, again, like I said at the top of this conversation. If be it, it would be so easy, and I think it is really easy for people to hate the way to Eden because it is it is a goofy far out uh, episode. Uh, far out, boy, does those words really uh, carry <laughs> carry definite meaning? But again, I've come to reappreciate re- appreciate it actually for the first time because there actually is a lot of stuff going on here. And because, again, this is the commitment. Steve, exactly what you just pointed out. This is the commitment that I am talking about going like, okay, well, it's different. It may not be for everybody. But I, they took a swing and they committed. They got a, they got a double out of it. And it uh, feels like, you know, this is the kind of thing you could easily see them, um, especially at this stage of the game, writing Spock as a, like, no, you know, I'm a man of science. This is all garbage. I'm not going to have anything to do with it. But instead, they're reaching back to some of the very earliest moments of spock of yeah spock digs music look he can play an instrument he can he can go let loose in the in the lounge there with everyone else and he does it's funny there are two other episodes that i'm thinking of one that has a hugely long quote-unquote performance section and another that has a shorter one both of which i hate one is plato's stepchildren where Mm -hmm. they are forced to perform for the Platonians, which is just horrible. Yeah. And then the other is what's her name and who gods destroy doing her dance number, which goes on forever and is stupid. <laughs> I hate those. I don't hate this. I do yeah. think it goes on forever. And I don't quite know why we're spending so much time listening to them sing. I like, I actually like the songs enough that it's okay. And I do genuinely like when Spock sits down for his little jam session. <laughs> And I do like that music. It's kind of funky, jazzy, cool. Um, And it's kind of fun. Here's the thing. So, you know, we talked about how, you know, there are a couple of episodes that we recently covered here where it feels like they've got filler. Like uh, definitely in The Mark of Gideon, 
there's a lot of filler there. And there didn't need to be because that was an episode that really was a very ambitious episode that went nowhere. But even in uh, The Lights of Zetar, which I thought was definitely a step back up after a couple of conquers, you know, there's that whole briefing room scene uh, with the Lieutenant Remain that I felt like gets dragged on. So oh, yeah. mm-hmm. would you rather mm-hmm. see scenes of dialogue that dragged on and on and on? Or would you rather hear some groovy music? Well, I kind of like this music a lot. Even yeah, though, I'm into the groove. Uh, right? Totally. Mm-hmm. But by the way, I do think it's funny that Spock silently walks into the jam session and then when it ends, he just gets up and walks out. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. He's like, okay, I'm out. <laughs> But Pizza. while this is going, while this is going on, uh, Tongo climbs up behind the security guard outside of Severin's cell and knocks him out with his thumbs. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Who knew? And then they end up at auxiliary control, and he takes out another guy, but does it differently. It's not the thumb thing. He like gives him a little back rub, and the guy goes out. Captain, I get no response from controls. It's channeled over somewhere. Artillery control. You would think at this point they would fix this by now. <laughs> like, right? Why do they have that seems... room? Ugh. Yeah, auxiliary sh- control should be auxiliary control, not not just make it so easy for auxiliary control to, uh, you know, basically block the bridge. <laughs> well, shouldn't uh, you have to like uh, enter a password or something before you can right? take over the Enterprise? It seems as though someone else is running the ship. That's right. Someone else is running this ship. I am. I like that there's a pause. He goes, someone else is running the ship. <laughs> and then you cut to the him on camera and he goes, I I am. Scott, do you remember what we talked about in um, Mark of Gideon where McCoy and Scotty and Uhura were talking to Spock while he was talking to the leader of Gideon and yep. they could hear, you know, it was like, this is so tough. Same thing happens here is that we have conversations about how we're going to override Severin while he's listening. <laughs> Right. Yeah, he can, like I'm standing right here. <laughs> and the other thing we find out is that not only are we not in control of the ship, but we're heading into Romulan space. I had made a note earlier that you know they make a mention earlier in the episode about we're we're close to Romulan space, and I'd kind of later written that that um, that the threat of Romulans is kind of the Chekhov's gun of this episode. Chekhov, the playwright, as opposed to Chekhov, the navigator <laughs> but, but in 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 the theater world Chekhov's gun is the the idea that if you show a gun like a rifle uh, in act one of a play you know, up in the up in yeah. the back of the set in the play that by act three that gun is going to go off right. um and here we kind of hear the threat of Romulans at the beginning but we never actually ever see Romulans nope yeah, it never, I, ha- know, that, never happens. It's like it was a big threat, and we thought, "Ooh, this is going to be wow!" And then the hippies versus the Romulans. Yeah, this could be something. No, no, no. That would have been a great episode. I mean, instead we have the you know, oh, we're in Romulan space. Never see a Romulan ship. Never had the Romulans attack the Enterprise. Now that would have been something. <laughs> yeah. There's an episode of The Simpsons where they're on like a school field trip with Bart, and they're on their. They keep talking about they're on their way to the fireworks factory. And soon we're going to get to the fireworks factory. And then they never get to the fireworks factory. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally what this there is. There you go. Yep. It's, 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 it's just, it, and you're absolutely right. This is definitely the, they introduced it. They either don't do anything with it at all or, but if you introduce it, you got to do something with it. Do right? something. Adam, there's a file on Dr. Severin in our computer banks. In it, you'll find a report attesting to the fact that he is a carrier a bacillus strain known as Cynthococcus novi. <laughs> Ain't that just awful? And so Spock tries to give him more information, more factual information that the guy he is listening to is not telling the truth. You know I reach you. I believe in what you seek. But there is a tragic difference between what you want and what he wants. You're making me cry. Neil, when you brought up that political thing that we don't really talk about too much on Enterprise Incidents, and I said there was another moment that made me think about people listening to their leader who is lying to them rather than listening to very clear facts that are presented to them over and over again, this was the moment I was thinking. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Really good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we sort of have now, by the end of Star Trek, the original series, blown that whole, we're going to try not to get too political on this show. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) 
<laughs> yeah. We cloud minders in this. We're kind of, it's oh been out gosh. the window. <laughs> yeah. How do you plan to stop them? By cutting off their life support? I have another weapon. And he starts working on some panel and, and Adam starts playing the song Heading Out to Eden. Heading out to Eden. Yeah. The slow version. There's two yeah. versions yeah. of it. <laughs> well, I'm using sound against them. Beyond the ultrasonic, it will stun them and allow us time to leave. Sound pitch that high doesn't stun. It destroys. And he goes, no, 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 it's not true. He says, I like this line. He says, it's correct for you to be concerned, but be assured also. And we had go into orbit. And now Tongo says to Severin. It does destroy. Okay. You, 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 you talk about how... Irina and Adam are following Severin, even though there are certain things that Severin is asking them to do that they, that they know is wrong. They think they should think is wrong. And, you know, here you have, uh, Tonga Rad is saying, you know, he's showing he's the kill defiance. Yeah. He's like, yeah. look, this, this will destroy. I don't think he's showing defiance. Or he's, well, he's, he's bringing it up. If he didn't right, care, but he doesn't he say anything. don't. He, yeah, he doesn't care. He's he he is saying you are going to kill them all. Well, I think that the, the, the I feel like his vocal inflection is insinuating like, hey, you know, this will kill them. It's definitely saying that, but I don't think. But no, well, so a couple of things about it because his vocal. What there's this. Have you ever heard about the magic couch? Do you know what the magic couch is in film or theater too? Mm-hmm. The magic couch is that I can be in a sitcom like I'm in Friends and I'm in the sitcom and it's Chandler and Joey and Monica and Rachel are in the kitchen four feet behind me. But if I'm sitting on this couch and say something in a normal voice, the people in the kitchen can't hear me, even though they're three feet away. That's the magic couch. OK. Irina is like two feet from Tongo when he says this line. He does not lower his voice at all. Right. There's no way she doesn't hear it. There's no way Adam doesn't hear it. And he doesn't say, hey, we we didn't sign up to kill anybody. That we're not about killing. Are you really going to? He doesn't say anything like that. He just says it does destroy. And then we never mention it again. And it's clear to me that Arena and Adam can hear that. And so they are now complicit in killing 430 people. Well, also Severance says, no, no, no. It's, it's at a level where it's actually not going to kill them. But is he telling the truth? No, um, he says that he says that before Tongo says what he says, not I after. He says, and I think he says it after. I think I think he says something after where he where he uh, reiterates, "Don't worry, nope. it's okay." What yeah, he, he sends he sends a tweet saying, "Yeah, don't worry about it." No, oh, <laughs> what he says after is, "I have adjusted it so that it will suspend its effects after a few moments and allow us time to escape. Then, after we've gone, it will automatically reactivate." Okay, all right, okay. yeah. There you go. And if it reactivates after they leave, he doesn't say it's ever going to turn off. Right, right. And that's when Scotty's phaser starts hitting the bulkhead. And again, I'm like, look, I understand that in Wink of an Eye, they did stuff that you couldn't get through these bulkheads. Or in uh, Day of the Dove, there was things that made it impossible to get through the bulkheads. I don't understand why you have so much trouble getting an auxiliary control now. But uh, we turn the knob. It's I like it. I think it's cool that Spock gets hit by the sound first. And mm-hmm, then it goes mm-hmm. silent and Spock is still in pain. And Kirk says, it's all right, Spock. It's stopped. No, Captain, it hasn't stopped. It has gone beyond. And then Kirk gets to do his patented um, crumpling in pain. Ah! Which, yeah, as yeah. I said before, yeah. I'm really sick of at this point in the, in yeah. the show. Yeah, how um, many and times at this can... point has he done it? Oh, and then we get lot. to see the same old, that same shot of Nurse Chapel crumpling from a oh, from Spock's episode, brain. different hairstyle than she had at the beginning of it. Yeah, they use stock footage of the crew passing out from Spock's brain uh, yeah. in the teaser of that episode uh, when when the uh, sound goes off in this one. Can I tell you something dumb that I noticed that I had never noticed before and never knew and I think is ridiculous and silly? Uh, yes. Both that I didn't know it and that I saw it for the first time in this episode and that this is how they did it is on the bridge, as everyone's passed out, you see Chekhov's chair has fallen over. And it never occurred to me, and I never looked, that the chairs of the helm and all the other ones are not connected to the floor. <laughs> that they're just chairs you could move around. And it's so mm-hmm. dumb. 
And I go, why in the world would you have shot? I mean, it, it's one thing that it is just a chair that you could move around because that's what they used in the set. But that you would show it knocked over. Like, of course, the chair should be bolted down. <laughs> like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> Had you Have you known that before? <laughs> Well, I knew that they could be moved just because um, there's this great book about <laughs> Star Trek and mid-century modern design. It even shows the original chairs that they were based on and and how they were adapted. But anyway, so yeah, I, I guess I knew they were. That's a good book. Could be moved, but it, it, yeah, I love that book. So uh, we're back in Act Four. We're awake enough, and Captain and Kirk still in pain has to go into the auxiliary control. Where he turns off the knob and we're all okay. And he calls around and no one's answering the ship until finally Sulu answers, asks what's happened to them. There are no Romulans, so that's a good thing. Uh, and that a shuttlecraft has been stolen. Let's well, we knew who we know which one of those hippies led them to the shuttlecraft, right? She knows how to drive it. Probably. Oh, that's a great she, point. she spent she spent all that time in there before before she dropped out of Star Trek. Oh, that's a great point. That's right. <laughs> Yeoman Mears. <laughs> yeah. I'm, gonna, thing- I'm just gonna go on the record. And for headcanon, and say yes, that that yes. final hippie is actually Yeoman Mears because you know she doesn't have any dialogue, she doesn't have a name, but she does have the face. And I just think that she got so like you know freaked out after her experience in the Galileo Seven that she joined the hippie movement, and now she's back on the Enterprise, and she no one recognizes her. <laughs> but that's also why Irina knew that. Um- Chekhov would be there and that they kind of had some inkling about auxiliary control because she could tell them, oh, yeah, this is the kind of stuff we had on the Enterprise. Oh, yeah. It all works. works. It's all there. It's all there. By the way, better episode. (laughs) I actually think that would be a better episode. Um, (laughs) Right. That would be good. And the other thing we find out is that Spock checks his sensors and that there are there's life forms on board the shuttlecraft, which is on the planet. But there's no life forms there other than that at all. And we beam down to this beautiful planet and we go. Legends were true, Captain. Fantastically beautiful planet. Eden. I guess it's Eden. It sure looks like Eden, but is it Eden? And then as they're walking around, suddenly we hear a scream. Ah! And guess what? Chekhov is in pain again. Bless his heart. Can we just uh, make note that we get to hear Chekhov scream? Because I think that's just as important. I had it. I had a big exclamation point after I wrote down Chekhov scream. It's like, yeah, I this too. Is, I have two. I still have some points about. on my notes. Chekhov scream. <laughs> Yay, Chekhov screaming. <laughs> is this the last Chekhov scream in the original series? Oh or do we have more? Uh, let's see. He doesn't. I don't know. Uh, no, I mean, the last time we see Chekhov, we see him in Turnabout Intruder, but uh, that's his last episode. God, it's everybody's last episode. He doesn't scream in that. The flower, sir. I touched it. It's like fire. And we examine it, and McCoy says, All this plant life is full of acid. And not the fun kind of acid that hippies like. They uh, (laughs) find Adam, dead Adam, who has been eating not exactly an apple, but in the Garden of Eden, Adam dies from (laughs) eating a piece of fruit. And and just to to you know be Captain Obvious about it, Spock says his name was Adam. (laughs) In case you didn't get it. I just want to point out too that. When The Way to Eden was going through its many rewrites, when Arthur Heineman came on to write the teleplay that, uh, you know, really made the bulk of the episode, instead of searching for the planet Eden, the name of the planet was actually Nirvana. So Heineman changed it to Eden. And one of the big changes that Heineman made to actually increase the stakes and the depth of the episode was it was Heineman's idea to make the vegetables and the foliage poisonous and deadly. Hmm. That was Heinemann's, Heinemann's plan. I, I, I can no longer list how many references to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden we've had on Star Trek, but certainly, yep. certainly the cage, certainly this side of paradise. There's the a apple. whole bunch of them. The, the apple, apple, obviously. Yeah, yeah. And this is the one with the least resonance. Like the one where it works the least in terms of me. Because it's too obvious. Well, and it doesn't say anything. You know what I mean? You know, like it really, and this wasn't paradise. It was, it was a fake paradise. It was, it makes, it also makes me go like, well, how did Spock find this planet? Like what it does, none of it makes any particular kind of sense. It looks like Eden, but it's not. It looks like Eden. Maybe he saw enough through his, uh, his research and said, I think this is it. But then they get there and they're like, 
following false prophets. Right. And the hippie movement looked like a, a good thing to Spock, but it turns out, well, maybe it's not. Well, and this is why I go back to if they had been searching for the perfect primitive planet to live outside of technology, that would have totally made sense. We're looking for Eden is a completely different thing. And I think much weaker in the in the long run for this particular mm. story. This is also one moment just to throw in here. I, I love this. Um, it's used again, too. But at Adam's death, we hear a really nice um, instrumental uh, rendition of the Heading Out to Eden song, um, mm-hmm. which it, it's it's really nice. I, I love that moment. Yeah, yeah, it's it is moving. It is moving. And I do feel bad because as much as I think morally they're, you know, I don't think Adam is necessarily a perfect guy. I do like him. He's very charismatic. Yeah. I felt bummed about him. And then yeah. we find the shuttlecraft, which is the Galileo 2. 2, right. Because the Galileo 1, as Yeoman Mears just knows because <laughs> he was there, burned up in the atmosphere at Taurus 2. <laughs> And they open up the door, and there are all our hippies with their feet all burned. And I have no idea why you so, take the hippies yeah, with bare quick, feet. Put them back. Put them back. And say, get out. <laughs> Come on, yeah, let me help you back. On. The, they're safer inside the shuttlecraft. Uh, what are they doing? Walk through Enterprise. Enterprise here. Stand by to beam aboard injured parties. Okay, Medical so. team to the transporter room. No. No, we're not leaving. We can help you aboard the ship. We're not leaving Eden. And they try to argue with them. And he runs off. They yell, come back, you fool. And he climbs a tree, grabs an apple. Severin, don't. You'll kill yourself. Don't bite into that. Stop. And of course he does. And he dies. We are back on the Enterprise. You know, back to the Starbase. So we're going to beam down. And this is where I wrote down. So no Romulans, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. Uh-huh. That, I mean, like, like, like if, you, if they would have gotten to Eden in Act 3 instead of Act 4, like you could have had uh, an episode with a whole lot of action, or maybe, or maybe they uh, came across a, a group of um, rock monsters there on Eden. Oh wait, no, that's aborted that's Star it. Trek Five. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're gonna go find a rock monster in a couple episodes in Savage Curtains. So. Oh yeah, Yarnick. Who also, yeah, didn't someone from Tiburon on that episode too? <laughs> maybe. Um, so. uh, and. Uh, We're on the bridge and we hear that three out of the four hippies have arrived to beam down in the transporter room. And Kirk goes to Chekhov and says, do you wish to attend? And Chekhov says, Captain, I wish first to apologize for my conduct during this time. I endangered the ship and its personnel by my conduct. I respectfully submit myself for disciplinary action. Did Chekhov actually do anything wrong? No, he really didn't. I don't think he did. No, no, he, he, but because he was helping Spock look for Eden. Or because he was, <laughs> right. you know, I mean, no, I don't think, yeah, yeah. Oh, I, th- I don't think he did anything wrong. I think he's just being hard on himself. You, you, you know what would have made this episode better? What? Is we talk about um, Chekhov and Arena when they broke up. Is what if Chekhov in Starfleet Academy actually did have a little bit of a wild side and liked to party with Arena? And that after they broke up, he's crushed all that and doesn't do that part of himself and then he was tempted by her maybe during the jam session and maybe he did leave his post a little bit at auxiliary control by her and then he would have something to apologize for right and then we would be more in this tension of are you always being correct or can you sometimes be incorrect is that okay that you know? sounds yeah. like the way to eden could have used the world famous steve morris rewrite well, thank you, but I also still think it's still better if it was McCoy's daughter and not Chekhov's girlfriend. <laughs> right. That's the Dorothy um, yeah. Montana rewrite. Yeah. yeah, that. Mm-hmm. You did what you had to do, as did we all, even your friends. You may go. And Chekhov goes off to meet her in the transporter room, but hey, no, she's here in the bridge because... Honestly, it's one fewer set to shoot, and it probably just saved him money to do it that way. <laughs> Being correct occasionally. And you be correct. Occasionally. Which I do genuinely like. Yeah, nice moment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then Spock says, It is my sincere wish that you do not give up your search for Eden. I have no doubt but that you will find it. Or make it yourselves. I love that line. Great line. I do too. Spock. Yep, Although I nice. also think they should all be arrested. This just all goes to the same, like, <laughs> we're always we're really nice to these people that steal the Enterprise and almost start wars. Um, 
then the last thing we hear is we reach the spot. And you know what? Maybe the fact that the hippies were not arrested is another sign, another subtle sign, like the one I pointed out about Chekhov helping Spock in auxiliary control look for Eden, that maybe Kirk is a little less rigid because he did not, he did not have them arrested. He did not move forward with having them arrested with the same, same uh, uh, drive that he wanted to try Lokai for stealing a shuttlecraft and let that be your last battlefield. So I think there was a little bit, a little bit of a subtle growth for Kirk on his part for being less rigid in letting them go. So did anyone have any interesting comments about this episode, Scott? Oh, well, the mother load. The oh, mother really? Load, <laughs> yes. Uh, in terms of comments. So Elizabeth Rogers, who came back as, as Lieutenant Palmer, had this, you know, short but sweet comment to say, the way to Eden was not as enjoyable for me as the doomsday machine. The, the director was a very rude little man. Oh, Whoa. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Whoa. So Victor Brandt said, I think emotionally they were ready to be canceled, meaning they knew they were getting canceled and they were tired. Whether they were unhappy or disappointed, I don't know. But you can pick up on how tired they were and they seemed like they just wanted to get it over with. James Dewan said, it was going to be a god-awful show, and I could tell that from the moment I read the script. I started making inquiries to the producers about the possibility of my opting out of that one, but I let them convince me that it might actually be a fun, offbeat episode. Social commentary on the generation gap. Well, I should have gone with my instincts. <laughs> uh, the actress who plays Arena, Mary Linda uh, Rapaline, uh, says... A lot of people didn't like our episode, but I think there was a great spiritual message in it. It was funky, and the portrayal of it was a bit clumsy. Some say it's camp, but I feel it is more naive. Regardless, I loved every minute of it. Producer Fred Freiberger says, I didn't like it at all, and I don't blame Dorothy Fontana's original story. We probably did it all wrong. I'm unhappy that I'm the one to blame for that one, but... There is no one else to blame. And then Dorothy Fontana, who started it with her original story, has these last words on The Way to Eden. I only saw The Way to Eden once. That was enough. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I, I will give my final thoughts. I will say I cannot recommend this episode to anyone. I can't say that it's a genuinely good episode. I can't even say that it's an average episode. I think it is a below average episode. I think, but I also think maybe more than any other episode, including Spock's brain, this one can be enjoyed as camp and just like Mm. accept what it is. Enjoy the songs. Enjoy Charles Napier's enthusiastic performance. Like, there's do the themes quite sync up and work right? No. Do I feel a deep emotional connection to the Chekhov story? I wish that I did, but not that much. Does all of the ideas quite make sense? No, not really. Is it terrible and painful for me, like several of the other episodes we talked about recently? Not at all. I did not find this terrible and painful. I just don't think it's necessarily all that good. Neil, what are your final thoughts on the way to Eden, especially after joining us for this deep dive conversation? Well, I, I think I, I appreciate it even more, but, um, but like Steve said, it's, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's never going to be one of the great episodes. Um, it's not going to be one that I'm first going to go rewatch, but at the same time, there's enough to enjoy and appreciate in here that I'm absolutely going to watch it before I watch, you know, the alternative factor any day of the week, any day of the week. And come on, um, I'd watch a super cut of just all the hippie scenes. I'd be all into that. (laughs) Well, I, I, I gotta say that, like I said, at the top of this show, I have a much deeper appreciation for the way to Eden. I feel like I misunderstood that, that it was a bad episode. I think it's a misunderstood episode. Is it an episode that I would say, Hey, you've never seen star Trek. Oh, here's one for you. The way to eat it, you're going to love it. I would never say that. What I would say is if you love Star Trek, like really love the original series, and even love watching 
the not so good episodes because you just love Star Trek and because you just love these characters. See, that's how I feel about Star Trek. I'll watch The Way to Eden now because I actually really did like this episode a lot. And I just love the characters. And I appreciate it more than anything else that they they went for something. And they almost got there. They got close enough. It is uh, an episode that I take for what it is. It has a lot of enjoyable elements. The music being among those enjoyable elements, Charles Napier's performance, uh, Walter Koenig's performance, his chemistry with Irina. Uh, mm-hmm. I have a lot to recommend it if you are a real big Star Trek fan who hates The Way to Eden, you know what? Maybe you should give it another watch because it's actually not bad for what it is. It's certainly not the worst episode. And you know who I... Okay, real quick story. Ben Stiller. We all know who Ben Stiller is. Mm -hmm. I know that he's a big, big Star Trek fan. So back in 2008 when he was filming, uh, what was it, Uh, Tropic Thunder, uh, we did a set visit. And uh, when I was at Access Hollywood at the time, and I know that he's a big Star Trek fan. So I said, hey, look, Ben, I know you're a big Trekker. I am too. I said, I've always wanted to know, what is your favorite episode of Star Trek? So I thought Ben Stiller was going to say like, oh, Balance of Terror, Sitting on the Edge of Forever, The Doomsday Machine. And he says, I think my favorite episode is The Way to Eden. And I remember saying to him, what? Are you kidding me? Of, Of all episodes, why on earth is The Way to Eden your favorite episode? And he said because it was just different, it was it was totally far out, uh, and I just love how crazy it is. And I think you know what? There's a lot to his comments about why that episode actually works, and I finally get why he feels the way he does, and uh, I agree with him. That's real now, brother. Real now. <laughs> we reach, Neil. We, we reach. reach. We reach. Well, so if you're not a Herbert and you do want to actually discuss this episode, then the best place to do it is on our Facebook page. Just do a search for Enterprise Incidents. It's Enter Incidents on Twitter, Enterprise Incidents on Instagram. And of course, if you haven't already, you really should subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or YouTube or Stitcher or Overcast or anywhere else you get your podcast. And while you're there, you should look at the show notes because at the top of the show notes is a link where you can support the show for as little as 99 cents a month. You can also leave your reviews on Apple Podcasts, which definitely help us get the word out there. And if you want to reach me, you can do it at SR Morris on Twitter, SR Morris one on Instagram. And if you want a movie that maybe does a slightly better job of discussing the youth movement in the 60s, you can listen to the Cinephiles discussion of Mike Nichols' The Graduate. I would highly recommend that. Mm. Scott, how would people find you out in the interwebs? You could find me on Twitter and Instagram at Movie Mance. And now that we have finished The Way to Eden, uh, we have only four episodes of Enterprise Incidents to go. Only four more episodes on our journey of the original series. And I just want to take this moment to say something that Steve just said just a moment ago, and that we said many, many times throughout uh, Enterprise Incidents at the end of the episode, sometimes at the beginning. So we really rely on your support, and we are grateful for your support. And we really do love reading your comments on our Facebook page, which is Enterprise Incidents. So if you have not yet subscribed to our Facebook page, please go and follow us on Facebook so you can see what is coming. You can be the first to see what will be next on Enterprise Incidents. And after after we are done with the original series, Enterprise Incidents will continue. I'm just going to say that Enterprise Incidents will continue. And also by this point, Steve and I have said, please leave a review for us on Apple Podcasts. So maybe you've been meaning to do that, but you got sidetracked, or maybe you just haven't thought about it, but we would really love to read your reviews on Apple Podcasts. So as we are approaching the end of the original series, if you have not yet done so, please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave a review for us. Let us know what you have thought about our journey, our voyages through the original series. And in the meantime, Neil Shirley, where can people find you on social media? Uh, people can find me talking too much on Twitter. Um, I am at that Neil guy, and my name is spelled N E I L, that Neil guy. Um, and also, I would love it if you would subscribe to my Star Trekking newsletter where I try to share 
just random bits along the final frontier. And you can find that at startrekking.substack.com. Well, Neil, we want to give you a very, very big thank you for joining absolutely. us. And, and thank absolutely. Thank you for having me. Oh, my goodness. You have helped make this deep dive conversation of enterprise incidents go above and beyond. You know, even on some of the lesser episodes, Steve and I have really worked extra hard. Well, if the episode isn't great, at least we're going to make the conversation really stand out and be great. And you really helped us do that with our deep dive on the way to Eden. So we are grateful to you for that. And coming up next on Enterprise Incidents, only four more episodes to go. Our next voyage takes us to Requiem for Methuselah. Very, very curious to hear what uh, you think about that one. Very curious to get into our conversation. So until the next episode of Enterprise Incidents, keep going boldly. Boldly.